In this lecture, we would like to discuss network normalization. The idea is to control the statistics of the values in a tensor processed by the network, for example, the mean and the variance. The normalization is added as a layer to the network. So similar to other layers that are building blocks of a neural network, like a convolutional layer, a linear layer, a nonlinear activation function, we will now discuss multiple building blocks that are normalization layers. The input and output of the normalization layer, these are tensors of the same size. Similar to the nonlinear activation functions, the size of the tensor that comes in, that means rank and dimensionality along each axis is the same as whatever comes out. Um, some normalization layers need access to a batch of samples, for example, a batch of images during training. While some of the discussion of why these normalization layers help uh, is deferred to later in the lecture, uh, overall we can just say that empirically these normalization layers have shown to provide a big improvement in practice. For example, not only are the higher uh, values better, you know, the metrics better at the end, also it's possible to train deeper networks uh, as than is possible if these normalization layers are not used. We can say that normalization has been instrumental and essential in making neural networks deeper. Here's just an inspirational example. There's a tensor x in, or we can say x1 equals x in, that comes into the network. Then there's the first layer, a convolutional layer that processes the tensor and outputs another tensor. Then it goes into a nonlinear activation function and outputs the other next tensor x3. And then we have a building block that is called batch norm. This is one type of normalization layer. And it also takes a tensor as input and it gives another tensor as output. And what I like best is uh, to really consider these normalizations as a separate building block in the network uh, that makes it easiest to really understand what they do. They're often described kind of together uh, in functionality with other layers but I think it's best to really consider them separately. So I want to start like really, really basic because what we will see is that superficially all these normalization layers look exactly the same. And in the progress of this course, we will see even more normalization layers. It seems they all, uh, you know, do something with mean and variance but the problem is mean and variance of what exactly? So the difficult part in understanding these normalization layers is to understand what exactly of a tensor is being modified and how exactly these um, statistics are computed. So I'm going to start very, very basic here. Let's just start with an example of a rank two tensor, that is a batch of vectors. Let's stick with our standard example that this batch of vectors uh, encodes a batch of images that have been vectorized. So each image, let's say each grayscale image, is a single vector and each entry in the vector corresponds to a pixel. And we are pro processing a batch of those at once Let's just say the batch is maybe of size 32 or 64 or 128 to get just some intuition of what is going on. So um, this batch of images, this batch of vectors is now organized in this rank two tensor. And we have the uh, values n that tells us the number of samples, the numbers of images in the batch and d the number of dimensions the number of values in a vector, for example, the number of pixels in these grayscale images. So 
here's a visualization and the important thing to note is that the data here is in rows. So each row here corresponds to one image. Each row corresponds to one grayscale image. And uh, each column corresponds to one particular pixel. So the first column corresponds to the first pixel seen in each of the images within the batch. So if the batch size is 64, we have 64 images. The first column has 64 entries and all of these 64 entries correspond to the first pixel in each of the images. I'll use this uh, computer science notation, which I prefer over the traditional math notation, since I think it makes things a bit clearer. So we have a tensor X and we index it with IJ and I is the index for the first axis with matrices. The first axis is the row number and J is the index for the second axis and for matrices this is the column number. So X3 for example refers to the third uh, sample in the batch, refers to the third image and then J would describe the pixel number in the image. So here is an example batch that consists of three images. Each of the images is described by four pixels. And now you often hear some terms like, okay, we, we take the mean and the variance, or we, we are going to uh, compute the mean across uh, rows, or we compute the mean for each image. And I find this often very imprecise and confusing. What exactly is this computed over? So uh, there are multiple options here. One option would be to compute the mean for all features in a single sample. So I could compute the mean that per row. So for example, we have the first image has four pixels, one, zero, zero, nine, and I could compute the mean of that, which would be given by minus two. And then the mean of the last image, last row, for example, would be four. So this is one option. And then, of course, when you compute the mean uh, this way, and then you hear terms like uh, we subtract out the mean or we subtract out the row mean, then uh, the way you subtract corresponds to exactly how the mean is computed. Even though you only see the example here for the mean, I hope it should be completely clear that uh, the variance then is computed in an analog way, analogous way. Uh, so uh, mean and variance that you'll see a lot in the following slides will always be computed in the same way. Let's look at option two now. We could compute the mean for each feature across all samples. So we could go column wise, which would correspond to, in our image example, computing the average pixel value for each image at one particular position. So computing the average value of the first pixel, if I take the first column, for all images in the batch. And uh, here's the example, how this would look like. So in this case, the mean would have four entries, one for each possible column in the matrix. And uh, this is the computation. And all of this is just to make sure that you really, really understand the difference between these two and that when later on a mean or variance is computed, you really know uh, what it is computed over. Now, alternatively, one could compute a single mean for all pixels and all samples. So you could compute a complete one single mean for the complete matrix. However, there are also many other options, especially when we go to higher rank tensors. But first, you also, just a hint, you might have heard of a double centering that is used to derive classical multidimensional scaling if you took another machine learning course. Uh, so 
this hints that there is one option to actually do multiple normalizations in sequence that also have a place in machine learning. However, this one option of multiple normalizations in sequence is not something that seems to be popular, at least not now. Um, there's some of that going on, I guess, but this is not something we will uh, address here in this introductory lecture. Um, then there's the idea to do normalization across groups of features. So, for example, I could look at this data set of three images and say that, okay, the first two pixels, we compute one mean for those, and then the second two, we compute the mean for those, or, you know, the images might be a lot larger, so we could say, okay, for the first half of the image, the first qu quadrant of the image, we compute the mean. And uh, these are also design choices that are possible and that people explored. Now, this is unfortunate where the uh, simple drawing skills of mine end. How do we visualize these much higher rank tensors? Uh, now, there are more uh, choices simply because there are more axes, and then we could compute the mean over several axes at once and leave out others, or like compute the statistics in general. And it's also possible then to have partial computation over a partial set of the axes. So there's a large number of design choices. Let's start by the most popular and probably the most important form of normalization called batch normalization. We will look at normalization uh, in two, for, for two types of input. The first type of input we look at here is a matrix encoding a batch of samples. And as before, we have n as the number of samples, and each sample has d feature dimensions. So let's say n images, and each image has d pixels. The output, as we discussed, has exactly the, fame, the same size. So here is what we're going to do. We first normalize to zero mean and one variance. Second, we will add a new mean and multiply with a new standard deviation. Um, so the, the uh, multiplying this uh, with variance standard deviation, you will see it's just done in the correct way. Um, of course, the variance is the square of the standard deviation. So you just need to be careful to not mess these two things up. This is a layer that has learnable parameters. And in particular, there are two types of new learnable parameters, gamma for the new standard deviation and beta for the new mean. But since we compute multiple means and multiple standard deviations, depending on where we compute them, these are going to be tensors or vectors by themselves. So uh, these learnable parameters are going to be uh, more than just two. All right, let's look at the computation. So most importantly, note the design choice that these statistics are computed uh, for each feature dimension, and they're computed across all vectors in a batch. So taking the image analogy or the image example again, we would compute the mean for each of the pixels, and we would uh, compute the statistics for uh, each column, taking the data matrix format from before. We would, com we would really compute the mean over all images in the batch. So you already noticed this is the uh, main example of a normalization layer that requires a batch of tensors as input. So the mean then is computed for each column. So this vector mu, the vector of means, is going to be a vector that has as many dimensions as this data matrix, uh, this input tensor has columns, and the mean is computed in a straightforward way. We can extend this uh, to, to the variance. I think you should recognize this 
as uh, the equation of the variance and in the same way as we had um, the values that are going to be computed for the mean, we compute the values for the variance. So there's one such value for uh, each column of the input tensor. Also note that uh, I'll just use this expression sigma square to denote the variance and I use it as really a variable name by itself. So when I write sigma square j and um, I'll, I'll, you could think of it as a vector that is computed and then reused in the next step. So next we normalize and shift and rescale. So first we want to subtract out the, the, the mean and uh, we we want to divide by the uh, variance uh, square root. So we want to divide by the standard deviation. Okay, so normalize has two parts. We subtract the mean and uh, we divide by the standard deviation. And this is a robust estimate of the standard deviation because there's epsilon, just some very small value. All right, let's discuss this very briefly. If the sigma square j happens to be zero, then uh, we're going to be in trouble. So uh, adding a small epsilon value guarantees that this is at least slightly positive here, and then we don't um, get into trouble with a zero. What's the problem? The problem is square root of zero is zero, and then dividing by zero gives a numerical problem. So um, how does this work? So you could imagine that this is a for loop going over each value in the in input tensor. And for each value, you subtract out this previously computed um, column mean. And the idea here is then uh, you need to be careful what exactly these indices mean. Uh, and maybe double check the equation after the lecture to make sure that you really understand this correctly and you understand the notation correctly. So um, this vector mu that is subtracted will be different for each entry of the input tensor. So this is the input tensor xij. And um, the sigma square will also be different for each entry of the input tensor and it, for each column, this value will differ. So the output is denoted with x hat, and this is an intermediate tensor that is computed here. Now, as a next step, shift and rescale, we would like to introduce the new mean and the new standard deviation, the new variance. So, um, Gamma refers here to standard deviation, and by taking these intermediate values and multiplying them by gamma and adding the new mean beta, we can achieve this shifting and rescale. Again, let's be like super careful. The beta and the gamma that will be added changes depending on the column. It would change, for example, depending on the pixel in the image. So each pixel in this vectorized input image would have a different um, standard deviation and a different offset, a different mean that is being learned. So this requires therefore one learnable parameter per feature per pixel in the image. One thing to note here is that if you would learn gamma is uh, sigma and beta equals mu, you would recover the identity function. So this is something you observe in network design that people want to give the network the option to at least do nothing if uh, it seems like nothing is the best uh, choice. So 
the network could in some sense learn to recover the identity and just do nothing in the normalization. This is an argument that is used sometimes to justify design choices to say that, okay, at least you could learn the identity. If this layer is not useful, then the network should learn to just bypass the layer by learning parameters that let the layer do nothing. So again, this is more like some uh, inspirational, uh, this is some way to justify a design choice, how important that is and uh, how much of that really happens in practice is not very easy to determine. Let's discuss batch normalization during test time. What we discussed before was batch normalization during training time. So um, what's the main difference? So during test time, you could say, OK, I also I just insert a batch of images and uh, things are fine. Well, not really. Generally, there's the requirement that the uh, network function does not hap happen, uh, this, the, at inference time is not dependent on having to work with batches, you still want to compute the inference one sample at a time, one image at a time. Otherwise, there's some kind of very complicated uh, dependence and uh, you could also imagine many cases where you just don't have a batch of samples. So for example, if you have a mobile phone app that can do image classification. You take an image of something and say, what is it? You don't want the app to say, well, I can tell you only for one. Why didn't you take eight other images of eight other objects? And then I'll give you uh, a classification. So um, this fact that during training, the estimates for mean and variance depend on the, on the mini patch is somewhat uh, bad for inference. So, uh, what we'll do is we will find another way to estimate the mean and the variance standard uh, deviation that will be used in the normalization step rather than relying on a uh, mini batch of uh, samples providing during inference. And what we're going to do is we will observe how these values behave during training and we compute an average of this uh, mu vector and the sigma squared vector during training. So how should we do that? Well, just remembering all the values and then uh, computing an average at the end is unfeasible. Infeasible, there's going to be too many values. Also, in general, we believe that the values later on in training are more important because the values early on in training, there will be all sorts of other values that are not fine-tuned yet, so these will not be nearly as relevant than the values later on in training. And there's this concept, we'll discuss it a bit uh, in a bit more detail later on, this exponentially moving average that allows you to compute an average that gives a higher weight to um, more recent values. So you can just do this computation, you don't need to really uh, have a uh, memory devoted to keeping a lot of the samples and averaging later, you can this mem this exponentially move moving average just requires you to keep one vector that is continuously updated. And uh, so this is the choice. It gives more uh, weight to the more recent values and it doesn't require a lot of extra memory. So we can use these from training and these have to be frozen. These are now constant during inference time. And then the normalization and shift and rescale is going to be the same as discussed before. So these are just references to the equations on the previous slide. So the last two steps are the same during test and training, but the first two steps are different. Also note, that during testing, batch norm is a linear operator. 
Therefore, it can be fused with previously fully connected or conv layers in some way if you really want to save the last millisecond at inference time. So now we're going to look at the spatial batch normalization. That is, we're going to go from a batch of vectors to a batch of rank 3 tensors. All right, this is the Python command. And uh, let's just uh, briefly discuss this input again. So we'll have now a batch of rank 3 tensors, a batch of images that have height h with w, and they have the number of channels c. And we have a batch of n of those rank 3 tensors, a batch uh, n of those images. So the number of features refers to c, that is the number of channels that each of the images in the batch has. And all of c has to be the same for each image. Epsilon is what we discussed before, the numerical stability, in the, uh, the, so this epsilon is added uh, at the for the variance computation. And here you see the equation for the exponentially moving average. So the the statistics is always updated, so the mean value would always be updated by taking um, the old value times 1 minus m plus the new value times m. And this is called the momentum. We will also later see that in optimization. This is a very popular thing to use, this uh, exponentially moving average. So you can give this uh, parameter m to decide how, how the um, statistics are updated during training when they're used then at runtime. All right, and so you could set if these uh, batch norm parameters are learnable or not. So um, you can either make this as a separate choice. Typically, uh, during uh, training, you would like these parameters to be learnable. So we'll look at this by making a contrast to the batch normalization uh, of vectors. And so I'm going to explain this uh, notation here again. So this is what we looked here before, batch normalization for a batch of vectors. So the batch of vectors is stored in this rank 2 tensor, this matrix X, and we are going to have n rows, n is the number of samples again, and d columns, d is the number of features, for example, the number of pixels in a vectorized image. And this notation means that we aggregate over all samples. So if you're thinking of this tensor that has uh, size n times d, and this notation n goes towards 1, it means we are averaging over this first axis, the n axis, and this averaging makes a 1 or this n will be changed to a 1. So if you would like to know the size of the vector that encodes the statistics, we will look at the input and we will replace the n by a 1. So replacing the n by a 1, we are obtaining a 1 times d. So this is a vector of size d or a vector of size 1 times d that describes these two statistics, mu and sigma. So mu and sigma are vectors of size d, dimension d. Also very important, and this is a tricky detail, the gamma and the beta, beta have size 1 uh, times d, so they have the same size as these vectors for mu and sigma. Now we contrast this with uh, batch normalization for a batch of rank 3 tensors, where the input now, again, number of samples n, number of channels c, height h with w, and here we average over all samples and over all pixels per channel. So in this notation, n will be changed to 1, h and width will be changed to 1. So if you go here, n will be changed to 1, height changed to 1, w changed to 1. So we see that mu and sigma are going to be of size 1 times c times 1 times 1, which is the same as a vector that has c dimensions, c components. 
That means that if I give you a batch of images that the mu and sigma is, is the, the, the size of this is independent of the size of the images. We really compute one value per uh, channel. And that means if we look at um, a batch of images coming in, we would go look at the first channel across all images that are in the batch and compute one val value. Then we go over the next channel. We would average all values in the, in the second channel across all images. And then we get one value describing a mean or a standard deviation. So the learnable, trainable parameter for um, then not for, for then uh, doing this uh, shift and rescale in the end, they also have the same size again. All right, so let's look at this tiny detail. The batch normalization, it uh, takes out the mean value. Therefore, for certain layers, it becomes irrelevant for them to learn a constant offset that is added to a channel. For example, the linear layer has this uh, bias term that is added basically to a complete channel. Uh, but this is unnecessary because now the batch norm will take that out anyways. So if you have a batch norm, batch normalization layer directly after linear layer, it doesn't make sense for the linear layer to learn a parameter that will be subtracted out anyways. So where to put the batch normalization? This is a tiny detail that um, actually is something that I, I found a bit uh, tricky in the beginning because this batch normalization in the introductions that I found didn't it wasn't, it wasn't clearly drawn as a separate block. Now, if you draw it as a separate block, the choice becomes totally obvious. You can put the batch normalization anywhere in the network. So, for example, you can put it after a nonlinear activation layer. So, add as a real layer, you can put the batch norm after. However, you can then also put it before. Or, why not have the, the, the more the merrier put it uh, like everywhere after every layer put, put a batch norm. Originally, the batch normalization was inserted after the fully connected or convolutional layers and, bef and um, before the nonlinearity, but, but now every version exists. I think the original paper argued why this is the right choice. And uh, then people found out, hey, everything kind of works. And uh, the batch norm can be either before or after, but typically not both. So let's discuss advantages and disadvantages that different authors uh, have listed for batch normalization. More significantly, I believe that this batch normalization is instrumental in training deeper networks, such as the resonant. This really has been instrumental in going from, let's say, uh, deep neural networks with 19 layers to going to neural networks with 100, 150, 200 layers. It improves gradient flow. This is a bit abstract, but maybe we can just say that during learning, you know, there are these parameter updates, and uh, it is a problem if the gradient gets too small and the updates are too small. So the batch normalization kind of helps all parts of the, or, or get more parts of the network to receive meaningful updates to the gradient so that the parameters are changed more and uh, the network keeps learning. All right, this doesn't make that much sense. This is a bit of an abstract argument at this point in time. So, um, it allows for higher learning rates, faster convergence. The network becomes more robust to initialization. So because the uh, initialization often has a big influence on 
how the network behaves initially. Um, you might initialize the network weights, but as we will see, if you do it the wrong way, um, the values can be just so bad in the beginning that it takes a very long time to, for learning to start. And uh, since there is all this uh, automatic uh, renormalization going on, the, net, the, initial, 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 the initialization is less important and the network is more uh, robust to the, initial, to the initialization. Also, it acts as regularization during training this has been discussed in, in uh, various forms. Um, again, this is a bit speculative, but for example, you could say that um, the estimation of mean and variance for a batch is some form of estimate for the mean and variance of all the existing samples. So maybe you have a million images but one batch, one mini batch, only has 128. So it's kind of a simple, noisy estimate. Maybe the mean and variance is a noisy estimate for the mean and variance for all million images. So you could think of it as this um, estimate being something like the true value plus some random noise depending on which images are in your batch. And then people said, well, maybe this noise is acts almost as adding some random value to the mean and the variance and then the network becomes more robust to adding this kind of random value. Okay, again, this is difficult to establish exactly, but uh, this is something people have argued. So there's zero overhead at test time. It can be fused with other layers. This is an advantage of batch normalization. However, one big problem is that it behaves differently during training and testing. This is a common source of bugs. Uh, you will all say it's kind of trivial. However, um, this has uh, also been a problem for people I worked with. And this is uh, easier to forget than one might think. It's hard to para uh, paralyze because it depends on this uh, Bat, because it depends on the batches. So if we now have, let's say, multiple computers, each processing its own batch, then the computed statistics will be different for each of the computers, each of the nodes. And uh, this is not that clear. How can we actually do that so, so that uh, this batch norm layer in distributed computing works? It's also not really good for uh, recursive neural networks, and uh, it's uh, generally not used there, according to the, uh, my according to my belief. Now, I'm not an expert on uh, recursive neural networks and the very latest developments in that field, though. Let's look at layer normalization. So, the idea here is we normalize over all features, all dimensions of a single input sample. We have the same behavior at training and test time. We don't need a batch of samples, and this is useful for recursive neural networks. All right, again, let's contrast this with batch normalization. As we saw before, batch normalization, we, we average, we can uh, compute the average uh, uh, standard deviation over all samples. So with an input of size n times d, this n becomes a 1, and the mean and standard deviation is 1 times d. But for layer normalization now, we have the same size input, but we aggregate over all d input feature dimensions, so d will be 1, and that means that the mu and uh, sigma are of size n times 1. So each input vector will have its own mean and, and, and its own standard deviation. However, this is very tricky here, the learned parameters gamma and beta still are of size 1 times d. That means every feature, let's say every pixel, 
in the input image has its own gamma and beta parameter. So instance normalization, what we do here is we normalize over all values in a channel. Same behavior at train and test time and no complications with parallelization. So let's contrast this with batch normalization for batches of rank 3 tensors. So as input now we have uh, this rank 4 tensors, n number of samples, c number of channels, height and width of the images in the batch, and batch normalization we said we aggregate over all samples n and over all uh, pixels per channel h and w, so the mu and sigma we get has uh, c dimensions. And now, for instance normalization, we only aggregate over the pixels per channel. We don't aggregate over the different samples n. Therefore, we have a lot more values, mu and sigma. We have n times c values, mu and sigma. That means every image, every sample in the input batch has its own mu and sigma vectors, one for each one value for each channel. And gamma and beta now are again learnable parameters, one for each channel. So here, main difference is we do not aggregate overall samples, and the parameters gamma and beta are learned per channel. So uh, this is a very sensible way, it does almost the same thing as batch normalization, but it doesn't average over the different samples. Now, uh, let's look at this last option and, and the nice visualization done by these authors. Um, so, uh, let me just go to the visualization and explain things there. It's difficult to visualize rank 4 tensors. So, the trick that the authors used here is they used one of the axes for the channels C, another axis for the number of samples N, and they jointly use one axis for the spatial dimension H and W. So this is now a rank 4 tensor that encodes, let's say, a bunch of images. So what is um, one single image? So one single image here would be, if you look at layer normalization, would be the all the blue blocks here. This is what would constitute one single image. So these are be the channels of the image across this axis and the different pixels of the image across this axis here. And then these are the different um, images. So basically this blue slice here would let's say denote the first image and then we could have a second slice here so you would see okay there are six different images six ways to slice the tensor in exactly this manner so what this visualization means is it says it kind of encodes um, all the values that all the it, it, it encodes kind of a slice through the tensor that will give you one single uh, mean or uh, variance parameter. So that, that is exactly the type, the values you average over, you compute the uh, variance over uh, in, in uh, computing the normalization. So again, let's look at the batch norm. That means we would go over for one channel and all the different samples and we would, get, we would get one single value. And so that means we, we took a look at this first uh, channel here. We look at all the pixels, all the width height uh, possibilities, and all the different images in, in the batch. And then this would give us one mu and one uh, sigma. So, um, the instance normalization, we can see now that we compute the average, uh, we compute the statistics over fewer values. We'll just 
compute for one particular channel and one sample, we average over all spatial dimensions. And so for one channel and one input image, we will get a single mu and sigma value. So the group norm is similar to the layer norm, only that we compute statistics for fewer values. So we compute statistics for only parts of the channels. So in this example here, there would be one mu and uh, sigma computed for the first three channels, and then presumably another mu and sigma for the final three channels. So the group norm is a proper generalization. So if the number of groups is one, then the group normalization is the same as the layer norm. So we, we, we think that this group is very, very large. It stretches across all channels C, then we can imagine that the group norm is the same as the layer normalization. And if the number of groups is C, so that each group only includes one channel, we would be at instance normalization. I just wanted to give some, uh, maybe, maybe some pointers to other types of normalization. For example, per pixel normalization, let's say as input, now we look at the single rank three tensor, a single image of size C times height times width, then we could compute the Euclidean length of each pixel and normalize the length to one. So with a pixel, what I mean is that we keep the height and width index the same. So there would be an index ij describing a pixel. And a pixel is a c-dimensional vector. So we would go across all the channel dimensions to basically have a vector that describes this single pixel. And uh, after this normalization, we get another tensor as output where all vectors, and this is the Python slice notation of the form, uh, you know, whatever, ij, have length 1. All right. So uh, let's say that we have an image that has height 1,000, width 1,000, and 64 channels. Then after this per pixel normalization, we, could, we would get 1,000 times 1,000 vectors of length 1, and each of the vectors has 64 dimensions. All right, this is really short. There's a concept of spectral normalization that is popular for generative adversarial networks that uh, uses the uh, singular values uh, in, in, uh, the, from the singular value decomposition to achieve some form of normalization. So here's some issue that is uh, batch normalization and distributed computing. So here's the problem. Some architectures require a large amount of memory for training. For example, semantic image segmentation. The reason is, let's say you have image classification. As output, you want uh, maybe one uh, single class. So, so it's kind of a small output. But for semantic image segmentation, if there's a large image, there will be one output per pixel. So there could be a lot of outputs, and then these Networks are uh, typically larger in size with a lot more parameters. So during training, you have a GPU, limited memory. You can only process a few images. And that means that the batch size on a single GPU is going to be small. Even it can happen that you have a batch size of only one or two. And then if, for example, you run your neural network with uh, a batch size of one and you use batch normalization, then this is kind of a time to stop and think about it. Well, what's going to happen? I give you a sample of one and then from one sample you estimate the mean and the standard deviation and you're going to be in some form of trouble. So uh, why don't we do um, distributed computing? Maybe we use 64 GPUs in parallel each of them can do one or two samples, and then we just try to do a, a aggregation of values across all these GPUs. But you need a specific implementation of that, and uh, that has been a problem somehow for some time. 
that this wasn't a very standard feature. This uh, implementation of batch norm for distributed computing. So if you're interested to know more about this, or if you work on these parallel uh, tasks that you know where where um, you you require to use batch normalization across a large number of GPUs, look up some terms like synchronized batch normalization. Now the behavior is not very intuitive. Let's look at some example result from some random paper, and what I would like you to observe is that you cannot really see a trend here. So there's an overall batch size and then the batch normalization size, I guess is, these are the number of samples that the batch normalization is computed over. And this is the main result. This is the quality, the higher the better. So let's say you have a batch size of two, batch norm size of two, you get the quality of 31.5. Then you go to four, it's like, hey, 34.9, this is a lot better. K88, now we make it bigger, this is again better, hey, it's really great. And then 16 times 16, again, this is, you know, typically 1% 1, 1 in, in uh, what is this? I guess this is something like mean average precision that 1% we're happy about, so big step. But then, you know, 16 to 32, this could be an aberration. And now we go to 64, all of a sudden um, goes down. Right, so so then these these things can happen, and then you have the ability to decouple batch size from batch norm size and try different variations. Most of them seem to be very similar, but again, it's kind of unclear how do you get there. For example, batch size is large and batch norm size is only sixteen, so you get thirty-seven. Okay, I guess this is consistent with this sixteen sixteen. But this is one issue, and there's also some warning that often people think larger batch size is better, but for whatever reason, you sometimes have these effects that maybe you do larger batch size and performance decreases. Doesn't mean that, you know, if you make it even larger, the batch size, it's not going to go up again. Um, now, overall, maybe to conclude, there is this uh, general idea that if you look at only the description of these methods, then um, you should hate batch, batch normalization and the idea it, it averages over samples. This is just a nightmare for implementation on so many different levels. And it doesn't really seem intuitive, at least not to me. It's like, how does it make sense to average over a batch of samples? Because in some sense, it's random. Like, how, you don't decide what random other images you're batched with and how it's, it's kind of depend it seems like some some noisy estimate of something else or you know you depend on other data how does it how does this make sense I mean, so therefore it uh, seems obvious not to use it but then it just works so well and then people have tried for uh, a lot of long time to kind of get rid of it and, and, and find another normalization that just doesn't have all these problems and that works equally well. But uh, I think there's no success so far. So to give one example, I don't have the paper here, but there was a paper that went, for example, in great length to design an alternative uh, normalization, but then in the end they found out that, okay, using the alternative normalization together with batch norm gives even better results and they still couldn't get rid of batch normalization. Also, this is more like a, let's classify it as the interesting anecdote, there's this idea that um, there's these two authors, they wrote this paper, Troubling Trends in Machine Learning Scholarship, and one of these troubling trends they identified is the failure to distinguish between explanation and speculation. This is a big problem in uh, deep learning because the reviewers and some of the readers of the paper expect um, you know, explanations, why does this work, but in reality it's very experimental and ultimately you can have maybe some intuition but ultimately it's very difficult to really pinpoint why exactly something work 
works or if it even works. And uh, the badge normalization is given as an example in this uh, paper because it introduced this concept of internal covariate shift. And it presents this as some form of problem and uh, batch normalization is something that kind of reduces this problem. However, as then others found out and uh, have discussed maybe in follow-up work, this isn't really so clear. What does that even mean? And is this, is this really true? Now, this is just an anecdote to know with regard to batch normalization. The authors, of course, who are famous scholars by themselves, they don't want to strongly bash other people. So they picked on some paper that is uh, extremely famous and well known and well respected in general and picked this as an example. Now, this is not something uh, that is especially bad. This is something you will see in uh, hundreds or thousands other papers done in a similar way. But uh, I, this is just an uh, interesting thing to know about batch normalization.